We are training each other in acts of communication we barely understand. We are, constitutively, companion species. We make each other up in the flesh. Significantly other to each other in specific difference, we signify in the flesh a nasty developmental infection called love. This love is an historical aberration and a natural cultural legacy. This manifesto explores two questions flowing from this aberration and legacy. One, how might an ethics and politics committed to the flourishing of significant otherness be learned from taking dog-human relationships seriously? And two, how might stories about dog-human worlds finally convince brain-damaged U.S. Americans and maybe other less historically challenged people that history matters in nature cultures? The Companion Species Manifesto is, as you have noticed, a personal document, a scholarly foray into too many half-known territories, a political act of hope in a world on the edge of global war, and a work permanently in progress in principle. I offer dog-eaten props and half-trained arguments to reshape some, some stories I care about a great deal as a scholar and as a person in my time and place. The story here is, I assure you, mainly about dogs. Passionately engaged in these accounts, I hope to bring my readers into the kennel for life. But I hope that even the dog phobic, or just those with their minds on higher things, will find arguments and stories that matter to the worlds we might yet live in. The practices and actors in dog worlds, human and non-human alike, ought to be the central concerns, ought to be central concerns of technoscience studies. Even closer to my heart, I want my readers to know why I consider dog writing to be a branch of feminist theory, or really the other way around. This is not my first manifesto. In 1985, I published the Cyborg Manifesto to try to make feminist sense of the implosions of contemporary life in technoscience. Cyborgs are cybernetic organisms, named in 1960 in the context of the space race, the Cold War, and imperialist fantasies of techno-humanism built into policy and research projects. I tried to inhabit cyborgs critically, that is, neither in celebration nor condemnation, but in a spirit of ironic appropriation for ends never envisioned by the space warriors. Telling a story of cohabitation, coevolution, and embodied cross-species sociality, the present manifesto asks which of two cobbled together figures, cyborgs and companion species, might more fruitfully inform livable politics and ontologies in current life worlds. These figures are hardly polar opposites. Cyborgs and companion species each bring together the human and non-human, the organic and technological, carbon and silicon, freedom and structure, history and myth, the rich and the poor, the state and the subject, diversity and depletion, modernity and post-modernity, and nature and culture in unexpected ways. Besides, neither a cyborg nor a companion species pleases the pure of heart who long for better protected species boundary and sterilization of category deviance. Nonetheless, the differences between even the most politically correct cyborg and an ordinary dog matter. Now, I appropriated cyborgs to do feminist work in Reagan's Star Wars times in the mid-1980s. By the end of the millennium and the beginning of the next, cyborgs could no longer do the work of a proper herding dog to gather up the threads needed for critical inquiry. So, I go happily to the dogs to explore the birth of the kennel to help craft tools for science studies and feminist theory in the present time, when secondary bushes threaten to replace the old growth of more livable nature cultures in the carbon budget politics of all water-based life on Earth. <laughs> Having worn the scarlet letters cyborgs for earthly survival long enough, I now brand myself with a slogan that only shoots and women from dog sports could have come up with when even a first nip can result in a death sentence, run fast, bite hard. <laughs> <laughs> This is a story of biopower and biosociality as well as of technoscience. Like any good Darwinian, I tell, I tell a tale of evolution. In the mode of nucleic, acidic millennialism, I tell a tale of molecular differences, but one less rooted in a mitochondrial Eve and a neo-colonial out of Africa, and one more rooted in those first mitochondrial canine bitches who got in the way of man making himself yet again in the greatest story ever told. Instead, those bitches insisted on the history of companion species, a very mundane, finite, mortal, and ongoing sort of tale, one full of misunderstandings, achievements, crimes, and renewable hopes. Mine is a story told by a student of the sciences and a feminist of a certain generation who has gone to the dogs, literally. <laughs> dogs and their historical complexity matter here. Dogs are not an alibi for other themes. 
Dogs are fleshly, material, semiotic presences in the body of technoscience. Dogs are not surrogates theory. They are not here just to think with. They are here to live with. Perhaps in the partners in the crime of human evolution, they are in the garden from get-go, wily as coyote. Now, uh, my father didn't quite know what to do with this communication. Uh, it was not the sort of story he filed with Western Union to make the press deadline for the press box. <laughs> Although he was very appreciative, he's an exceedingly kind man. But based on this kind of project, uh, I have uh, committed myself to telling four kinds of stories. Evolution stories, training stories, love stories, and breed or kind stories. Now there's several kinds of things I'm trying to do in these stories. One of them is to point out the contrast between two modes of prevalent psychoanalytic uh, describable pathology that I think are common among us. The first one I have named and hope to get into the di diagnostic manual, and I call it humanist technophiliac narcissism. By which I mean <laughs> the notion that man invented himself. Uh, and that man is involved in some kind of a narrative of technological escalation why, whereby the objectification of human intentionality in the world has finally surpassed itself and that man has achieved his objectification in a machine that will finally name him obsolescent as he is and destroy him in the technological apocalypse figured by the computer. That I regard as a technical, pathological condition, humanist, Technophilia and narcissism. <laughs> I believe that there are several kinds of dog stories that are symptoms of this particular mode of narcissism, and I will tell you one of them in the course of the coming lecture. I believe there is also a corollary mode of collective pathology that I think belongs in the diagnostic manuals that taking dogs seriously teaches us a great deal about, and I have named it caninophiliac narcissism, by which I mean that strange, uh, odd, a fancy, fantastic set of illusions whereby, whereby one believes to be the dog, uh, the dog to be the source of unconditional love. Uh, a really very, very strange idea. Uh, indeed, I believe the search for unconditional love in and of itself uh, to be a, a particularly alarming sign of mental illness and the notion that one has found it uh, in a cohabiting domestic uh, familiar uh, is surely a very, very serious state of illness. Uh, one woman, after I gave this lecture and gave what I kind of considered evidence for my position, raised her hand and, and described for me uh, the signs and symptoms by which her dog demonstrated unconditional love, such things as uh, uh, wiggling the, the rear end with the bottom close to the floor, a uh, you know, smiley uh, uh, lips pulled back, uh, smile grimace gesture, uh, licking, uh, occasionally even going belly up, a little bit of urinating. Uh, if the dog accidentally got kicked, a kind of, of uh, staying very close, uh, wagging the tail, licking, uh, and I, I described for her uh, from an ecological biolog biologist's point of view that she had just given me a long list of appeasement and submission gestures, and if by that she meant unconditional love, we were in serious agreement. <laughs> <laughs> and she shot. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, the stories that I'm telling, I think you will recognize some of the uh, many kinds of work that I am in conversation with, from other scholars and activists variously located around the surroundings. And in, uh, in discussion, we might be able to talk about some of these debts and connections. Uh, so I will, I will not um, say a great deal about them now, except to signal some of, the, uh, some of the most important. In particular, I am indebted to the anthropologist Anat Singh, because she taught me through her study of financial wheeling and dealing in contemporary Indonesia how to think about scale making, how scales of spatiality are constructed uh, in the kinds of interchanges through which borders, centers, frontiers, globalities, what gets to count as global, what gets to count as local, how scale making goes on in the making of contemporary arrangements, financial arrangements in Indonesia. From Anna, I have borrowed um, a sense of thinking about scale-making in relation to temporalities. 